Uh, okay. Installation complete. Hell yeah. You sure this is gonna work? Calculating success rate. Success rate is... Five. Five out of... You know what, I'll just try them on. Okay, switching on... <laughs> out of one quintillion. So it worked. Info link established. Cool. Uh, so you can see everything I'm doing. I see data representing electromagnetic radiant phenomena. Okay, okay, I feel like we're saying the same thing. Uh, am I gonna be alright? I feel like... What day is it? Send report. Uh, disoriented, paranoid, panicked, tired, kinda hungry. Based on previous data status is... Medium. Oh. Oh, good. That's great. Dreams wait, not a dream. It's generating. It's not closing. What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? Civilization is near collapse. The world economy is in chaos. A deadly virus ravages the Earth's population. And an ancient conspiracy bent on world domination emerges from the shadows of legend. And also, here's a review of a very cool video game. Deus Ex is a first-person cyberpunk late-stage capitalism hellscape immersive sim meme generator, and it was developed by Ion Storm and published by Eidos Interactive for PC and PS2 in the year 2000. Deus Ex technically began formulating as an idea after the release of Ultima Underworld 2 in 1993. One year after that, game designer Warren Spector, who was working at Origin at the time and had a hand in games like System Shock and Thief, the Dark Project, began to conceptualize a new RPG that would break free from the swords and sorcery theme of the Ultima series, one he felt had become a bit stale. He first pitched the idea to Origin, rest in peace, and sold it as a genre-bending, high-risk and high-budget non-stop action game called Troubleshooter. But the daunting nature of the project and the lack of technology to pull it off led Origin to turn it down and continue making Ultima games until their death in 2004. Their death rattle contained a sorrowful, put ninjas in it. Ugh. Around 1996, Spectre would leave Origin for Looking Glass, rest in peace, who were then just starting to develop Thief the Dark Project, which was still going by the working title Dark Camelot. According to Spectre, he tried in vain to suggest gameplay elements that would later show up in Deus Ex, like the option to spec your character for stealth or combat-based playthroughs, something they rolled with early on but like many of his suggestions didn't make it to the final project. He admits this came as a result of him just not being very good at Thief's stealth-centric gameplay. Meanwhile, he continued to tinker with the idea of Troubleshooter, changing its name to Junction Point, and pitching it to Looking Glass. Where Origins seemed to turn it down for a lack of interest, Looking Glass turned it down because it sounded expensive, which was a struggle for much of the studio's final years, and the year Deus Ex was released, Looking Glass was dissolving. In 1997, frustrated with his experience at Looking Glass, Spectre sought employment elsewhere, and was close to signing a contract with EA to work on a Command and Conquer RPG, which he had every intention of turning into troubleshooter in the Command and Conquer verse, when, as he describes it, his pen was hovering over the contract and John Romero, formerly of id and then of the newly formed Ion Storm, offered complete support for whatever project Spectre wanted to make. Not to go too deep into it, but Ion Storm was formed by Romero and Tom Hall with the intention of developing games with minimal publisher interference. Here's Romero being interviewed about the development of the game Dai Katana, which was in production simultaneously with Deus Ex, though at a different office. And here's level designer Stevie Case. It must have been so exciting working on innovative games for a reputable- What are you doing? What he accepted and development officially began on what was then being called Shooter Majestic Revelations. Looking around at world events and pop culture in 1997, Spectre and the Ion Storm team saw the growing popularity of conspiracy theories as depicted in shows like The X-Files, hysteria concerning the coming millennium, and fear of terrorism as a rich vein to shape a fantasy narrative out of. Conspiracy theory. 
a world where every conspiracy theory is likely true, from the Illuminati to UFOs. The writing process moved very easily, as there was already a growing wealth of technophobic stories about nanotechnology and augmented soldiers. Shooter would take gameplay cues from games like Half-Life, Fallout, Thief, and Goldeneye, but also confront you with tough philosophical questions that tapped into the zeitgeist of the late 90s. If you were augmented with machine parts, it is your brain uh, computers? Should the world be run by like two rich guys or like computers? Is 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 this a computer? They would also draw from films like Colossus, The Forbin Project, in which the US government hands over control of its nuclear weapons to an AI supercomputer, The Manchurian Candidate, in which prisoners of war were made unwilling participants in an assassination plot, and Robocop, in which a cop becomes a computer? The 20-person team filled a 500-page design bible, with a great deal of it changing by the time they went into Alpha. Somewhere in mid-98, it would spontaneously receive its fourth, final, grammatically odd but snappy and memorable name, Deus Ex. There was a fair amount of infighting partially due to how unconventionally the team was organized. When ex-Looking Glass designer Harvey Smith and ex-Origin designer Robert White both pushed to be made lead designer, Spectre decided that the competition between the two could be exploited to foster a more passionate and productive design. So he split the team into Team 1 and Team 2. But since, of course, neither accepted being labeled second, they were named Team 1 and Team A, where I'm assuming they both gave a begrudging nod and returned to their workstation, while Team 1 reasoned that numerals are usually listed before the alphabet, so... <laughs> Fuck those guys. Unfortunately, this mostly seemed to divide production and create two camps. One that thought they were making a thief-like immersive sim, and one that thought they were making a more traditional RPG just set in modern day. So the two teams would suggest conflicting ideas that also had to align with Spectre's vision and make sense to the programmers. Though a lot of the game's ambition had to be scaled down, a principle that was always being considered was emergent, emergent gameplay. gameplay. <coughs> for the layman gamer, for those not registered as an imsimp, this is when a game offers you numerous options to accomplish something in a game world with consistent rules and logic, but doesn't outright instruct you to choose one method, allowing you to experience things within the game that are the result of your thinking and not so much the intentional plans of the developer. Ion Storm knew they were on the right track when testers would describe cool things they managed to do in the game's alpha that the team didn't even consider and that they couldn't easily replicate. More Applications came from the decision to not use the Quake engine that Ion Storm used for Dai Katana, the reasoning being that much of the team didn't know how to design using it, and there was little in the way of instruction or support for it. So they opted for the more user-friendly Unreal engine. The only issue there was that Unreal at the time wasn't created to facilitate a game with dialogue trees and complicated inventory management, so much of that needed to be created manually. Three years and a few million dollars later, Deus Ex was shaping up to be a cat catastrophic failure. The dev team eventually had to confront Spectre about the ambition of the game's narrative, and the general consensus from playtesting was that the game simply wasn't fun. Further sowing doubt was their publisher, Eidos's confusion about what Ion Storm had been making this whole time, when they could have easily produced a linear, generic head clicker by now. The public perception of Ion Storm was also not doing great in the wake of Dai Katana's infamous John Romero is about to make you his bitch. Suck it down! Dai Katana, Iron Storm, and Sucky Down are trademarks of Iron Storm LP. All other trademarks and trade names are the properties of their respective owners. Suck it down! <laughs> Print ad, a misguided slogan dreamt up by the Dallas, Texas office's marketing team for their aggressive ad campaign that seemed to consist of mocking the reader, daring gamer idiots to play the game if they aren't too busy pissing themselves at the idea. So the Deus Ex team over at the Austin, Texas office had to contend with the purportedly toxic aura around its sister location, apparently losing out on many people interested in working on their game because of the stink emanating off of Ion Storm's name. Deus Ex lead programmer Chris Norton even expressed concern that the game may fail just by having Ion Storm stamped on the box. This created yet another divide, this time between both of the Ion Storm Texas offices. Harvey Smith would describe the Dallas office as having more of an extroverted frat boy atmosphere, where everyone at the Austin office were mostly pale nerds. 
This was ratcheted up when the art director of both offices complained about how mismanaged the Austin offices were to Ironstorm co-founder Todd Porter, who then called for the game's cancellation, a conflict Romero had to mediate several times and insist that the Deus Ex development be left alone. The original release date was Christmas of 1998, but in August of 99, the game had just hit alpha. Mercifully, Eidos granted them nine more months to complete the game, which allowed them to completely redesign the skill system and, as Spectre put it, find the fun. On release in June of 2000, it was met with universal acclaim and awarded several best of type awards. IGN would write that it looks to be the game that comes the closest to replacing reality as we know it. Perhaps the sole strongly dissenting opinion published at the game's release is a now infamous review written by Tom Chick, who described it as a cliche riddled game with horrid AI that uses one of the worst possible engines to tell an uninteresting story in unimaginative settings. A review so seemingly contrarian that the publication he submitted it to, Game Center, refused to even run it and assign someone else the job, leading to him selling it to another website. A rock paper shotgun interview with Chick from 2010 sought to provide some insight on why he would review it so negatively, and though he doesn't rescind his review, he does share an anecdote about meeting Harvey Smith, who asked him how he could be so so ruthless with Deus Ex and then positively review a forgettable game about monster trucks, which seemed to confuse even him. One could see this review and its censorship as an indication of how perfunctory game journalism and scoring games would become, but also I wonder why he wasn't imprisoned for writing it in a video game. In this game, he should be imprisoned inside the game he hates in real life. Obviously, Deus Ex was a success and remains an important, pivotal landmark in game design. Aside from seeing multiple releases like a Game of the Year edition a year later and a special limited edition published by Activision that tricked people into buying a demo disc for the same price as the full game, it lived on through modder communities that even now toil away attempting to either restore its unfinished content or implement their own. One of the most recent being a rather extensive effort to implement a playable female protagonist you look like the real thing. They actually let you operate on people? Which was planned early on, and the reason J.C. Denton was given a gender-neutral name, but never completed. Point being, there is a lasting appreciation for what this 20-plus-year-old game did, from passionate gamers to shitheads like Elon Musk that would be a villain in this game story, and is kind of the villain in real life, uh, that use J.C. as their profile pic on Twitter. There isn't much I can say about it that hasn't already been said, uh, but... Uh, I can say a lot of things about it. Not anticipating there would come a day when a baffling demographic of Americans completely bought hook, line, and sinker that every once laughable, implausible conspiracy theory was true, Deus Ex was written as just such a world, one like ours, plagued with extreme wealth disparity and suffering from a deadly pandemic called Grey Death, the one where the vaccine is so scarce that it's almost exclusively produced for government officials and the extremely wealthy. It's so rare that the average citizen isn't even sure it exists and is easily manipulated by frauds selling fake ambrosia. In this pseudo-pre-apocalyptic future of 2052, citizens have become absurdly divided. Though racism is no longer considered an issue, people with robotic augmentations are feared and treated as second-class citizens, whether they received them for medical reasons or cosmetic ones. Most people live in extended slums ravaged by riots and the prolonged fighting between the increasingly authoritarian government and paramilitary organizations classified as terrorists mainly the NSF, or National Secessionist Federation, a group that originated when much of the US's west coast wound up underwater and the country's resources were being funneled towards relief efforts and not so much the rest of the country, leading to various militias and fringe groups collecting in an attempt to have some states secede from the rest of the US. Given that these groups came out of middle America, a lot of this was propelled predictably by things like tighter gun control laws. Other resistance groups, like the French Silhouette, fighting for an equal opportunity to survive this pandemic have sided with the NSF mostly because they share a common enemy. Silhouette was a group born out of an underground newspaper and launched to the top of the US government's shit list when the bombing of the Statue of Liberty was blamed on them, following some veiled threats about targeting monuments. This supposed new threat led to the United Nations forming a new branch called UNATCO, or the United Nations Anti-Terrorist Coalition. 
This is where our protagonist comes in, J.C. Denton. He is a newly instated UNATCO agent following in his brother Paul's footsteps. Both Paul and J.C. are enhanced with new and experimental nano-augmentation technology, giving them superhuman abilities far exceeding the mechanical augmentation of yesterday. The two prequel games, Human Revolution and Mankind Divided, depict the transition from this era, where augmentation was achieved by literally removing limbs or organs and replacing them with cybernetic machine parts, but JC and Paul represent the future of that. Enhanced with tiny nanomachines that allow them to turn invisible or resist projectiles after a painless procedure that you can't even perceive aside from the bright glowing eyes. The immediate problem with this process is that it costs billions of dollars and the survival rate is concerning. And there are, of course, the moral and philosophical questions it raises to play God in such a way. In contrast to his more empathetic and cautious brother, JC is an idealistic loner that wholeheartedly believes he's working to save the world and he's gonna fix this broken country one dead terrorist at a time. This is no doubt where the majority of memes concerning the game are born out of. JC's near unhinged noir deadpanism, greeting every situation, no matter the context, like someone who would end your life at a moment's notice, then take a drag from a cigarette and look out at the skyline thinking, My city. Will you sleep tonight with one less scream to stir you? At the start of the game, JC is given his first mission to infiltrate a makeshift NSF base on Liberty Island, home of the now headless Statue of Liberty. There he is to recover several stolen containers of ambrosia, rescue a captured UNATCO agent named Gunther Herman, and apprehend the NSF leader. In about every mission in Deus Ex, there are variables that can change based on player choice, which was pretty much the buzzword that carried this game into being, choice and consequence. A light bulb War Inspector cites as being flipped on while playing the 1995 JRPG Suikoden, a game that offers the illusion of some binary choices, ones that don't significantly alter how the narrative will play out, and the idea of allowing the player to significantly change the course of a story fascinated Spectre. Which sounds awfully backhanded to then cite that as an influence, but I, I see where he's coming from. Yeah, this game made me think, uh, what if I made a good RPG? <laughs> in pre-production, there was a lot of unrealistic theorizing about how involved and immersed the player would be in the world of this game. How you could be anyone you wanted in this epic adventure. I think they realized pretty early on, nobody knows how to actually implement something like that. And the best they could swing for was a protagonist that at least has his ideology determined by you. JC has a personality, but the big choices he makes are your choices, and he will defend and enforce that in the charming way he does everything. I'm starving. Do you have anything to eat? You don't look that bad. The important takeaway from this first mission is that it shows the fundamental difference between Paul Denton and the rest of UNATCO. Even though your orders are to shoot on sight, Paul at multiple points insists you find some non-lethal way of neutralizing the situation. You even find out from some of the rank and file that he's been issuing them tear gas grenades instead of extra ammo, a strategy the top brass and the two augmented UNATCO agents we meet definitely don't endorse. This also gives JC a glimpse at what the other side believes. By the time he was dropped off on Liberty Island, the NSF had already moved the shipment of Ambrosia to their headquarters in Hell's Kitchen. So even though their leader winds up captured or killed, he gets to gloat that they ultimately achieved their goal and the cure will be distributed to the people. If you want, you can attempt to dunk on him and then leave to chase after the Ambrosia, but you can also initiate several lines of optional dialogue just picking his brains about the NSF's beliefs. They think the government essentially created a plandemic, concocting the plague and the vaccine, in order to thin the planet's population while keeping the 1% safe. He calls out UNATCO as the secret police for an illegitimate government whose presidents are chosen by the Trilateral Commission. Even this early, you get a sense for how naive JC is. The NSF leader has a lot of cool slogans and V for Vendetta quotes that JC just doesn't know how to respond to. He's essentially like, whatever, shut up, idiot. For a hundred years, there's been a conspiracy of plutocrats against ordinary people. You have a single fact to back that up. He didn't even know that UNATCO was responsible for the distribution of the vaccine. Back at HQ, he's like, wait, we do that? Here we meet the rest of the UNATCO team. Manderly, the boss, the big man. El Jefe. Ana Navarra, assigned to be our partner and along with Gunther represent the old guard of UNATCO. Cold-blooded, clicky, and unimpressed by the Dentons. Jaime Reyes, the guy that installed our biomods. 
Sam Carter, a semi-famous war hero that JC idolized in his adolescence, but is now relegated to being a gun uh, rental supervisor. I'm sure you could also check your coat with him if need be. Uh, there's Shannon. She hangs out in the bathroom. Not too sure what she does in there other than snitching. By the way, Deb, stay out of the ladies' restroom. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sure. Sorry. I'm deeply sorry. And Alex Jacobson, the communications tech whiz that gives you mission updates via your info link. Manjali wants JC and Anna to work together to shut down an NSF generator, protecting a warehouse they believe to be where the Ambrosia was unloaded so a second team led by Paul can then raid the warehouse. In Hell's Kitchen, you can involve yourself in a number of different conflicts and events, like saving a woman from some bozo in an alley, tracking down a black market arms dealer named Smuggler and defusing a hostage situation at the Ton Hotel. You can also get to know Jock at the Underworld Tavern, a stealth helicopter pilot working off the books for Unatco, who usually flies Paul from mission to mission. On the way to the generator, JC and Anna deal with an NSF group holed up inside Castle Clinton, which further reveals how ruthless she can be, ordering JC to exterminate the NSF. If you choose to keep casualties to a minimum, she chastises you for being too soft on them. After shutting down the generator and being choppered back to HQ by Jock, we learn that despite our efforts, Paul's team failed to secure the Ambrosia, and worse, he never returned with his team. And more worse, he's fired now. And worst of all, you won't be able to use the carpool lane on the way to work anymore. We see Manderly being chewed out by a mysterious government official that appears to have similar augmentations to yours. You can try to introduce yourself, but he says you're not ready to know his name, which I can only assume means it's Gilbert. Thinking that the NSF is going to load the Ambrosia onto a plane, JC is sent back out in the field. Down in the subway tunnels, the NSF have set up shop in the home of the mole people, but when confronted, they pretty quickly surrender and are downright cooperative, telling JC exactly how to get to the airfield, and some even say they were instructed not to get in your way. We follow the trail to a plane being loaded with ambrosia. You can relax, JC. I told the troops to stand down. That's right. I'm working for the NSF. I'll meet you at the 747. Excellent work. Oh, hey dude, is this where you wanted to meet? This is where you're handed one of the first pivotal choices in the game, and where a lot of info gets dumped on you, so it's as good a place as any to break in case you don't want any more of this game's rather complex plot spoiled, um, and I intend to spoil all of it, so I guess you can kind of just eject whenever you want to, but by now you got a pretty good idea what kind of world Deus Ex plays around with and what kind of themes are going to be covered, a little political intrigue, a little technophobia, a little little espionage action, a little hacking, something I no longer have to worry about after I rigged up the Parapug to act as my personal security system. Isn't that right? Can you, right? Can you give me a little update there, bud? Scanning. You don't gotta do a whole scan, I was just asking in, in a general sense. Virus detected. Initiate delete process, yes or no? Well, what is it? Uh, scanning. Did you just say, uh? No, 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 just, uh, just, just keep that, that, that's okay, that's okay. Now what's happening? Parapug? Hello. Uh, who, who is this? My name is Chad. What happens to Parapug? Maybe somebody hacked the Parapug's security system and tinkered with its programming. Oh, is that what you think? I don't know, but I think your friend is gonna be alright. Yeah, well, uh, I think it was you. I think it was you that did it, whoever you are. It's your buddy Chad. We go way back. Oh yeah? Yeah, sure. Way back where? Whereabouts do I know you from? California. Okay. Well, where in California? I don't have time. W what do you want? I'm looking for the mole people. What's the word on the street? Isn't that just a bunch of homeless people that live in a tunnel? Why do you want to find them? I'm looking for a gangbanger. Chad. Can I ask a question? I guess. Do you have a girlfriend? Chad, why are you asking me this? Hope it lasts. That, that's a very weird thing to say. How much? What? How much to take the lady off your hands for an hour? How much? Credit jets. What do you want to buy my- Please. 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 No! Here's 250 for the girl. No amount of credit chits you got. Pretty steep for secondhand goods. I want the 200 back. Chad, I, I don't like the direction this conversation has gone, so if you could I'll just- I'll check back with you later. Yeah, yeah okay. 
Paul comes clean about working for the NSF and mirrors the NSF leader we captured and doomed to interrogation and death earlier. He claims that the Great Death is a man-made virus, and as long as UNATCO is in control of the vaccine's distribution, they will be in control of everything. He wants to get the stolen shipment of Ambrosia to Hong Kong, where a man named Tracer Tong will synthesize it so they can give it to everyone. Aboard the plane is Juan Lebedev, a billionaire that has not only been secretly funding the NSF, but was instrumental in its first iteration and that JC has specific instructions to take down. He surrenders, well aware that, in theory, UNATCO should have a policy against killing unarmed prisoners. Ana Navara catches up to you and orders you to terminate the prisoner. This is where you make the call. Hear out Lebedev, learn what proof they have of this conspiracy that made your brother defect, or obey your orders and kill Lebedev. But it's not quite that binary. You could disobey the command and get Lebedev to explain himself, which leads to Ana becoming upset with you you, saying she's going to submit a complaint about your insubordination, and when you leave the plane, she kills Lebedev, and Paul will have run off. Or you could decide to make one of the most empowering and genuinely amusing choices that I've gotten to make in a video game, and turn Anna into a smear on the wall so you can have an uninterrupted conversation with Lebedev. Alex might chew you out a little bit, but he's, he's the kind of pal you want on your side. There's something particularly effective about the way Deus Ex handles these programming flags that I don't know if I've seen properly replicated since. Knowing that if you wanted to, you could just fucking blow up main characters and deal with the consequences is so entertaining. The threat of prophecy is not severed, you just won't have to fight her later in the game. Your buddy at HQ will just be startled, but friendship will win out and he practically hands you a shovel. Taking this route allows Lebedev to have a lengthy conversation with you, starting with the most important revelation. Oops, looks like I uh, might have nicked you there. <laughs> Sorry about that. JC and Paul's parents were murdered because they objected to what UNATCO had planned for them. More shocking, they weren't his biological parents. Even more shocking, he doesn't have biological parents. He was born in a tube by what he refers to as a cabal of technophiles. UNATCO and the entire United Nations is actually being controlled by a group of conspirators called Majestic 12. UNATCO has already surrounded the airfield and Lebedev will likely be killed by them, so he suggests JC play this cool and return to work as a double agent. Back at HQ, we get one of my favorite line deliveries from JC. Manjali kind of chews him out for Anna's death, which JC blames on Lebedev. Skeptical, Manjali suggests he not cover for Paul, as he's gone and they already activated his kill switch. The coalition has shut down his augmentations and activated the kill switch. Activated. What? It's one of the few times he seems to drop his cold, monotone exterior when realizing his boss could kill him at the press of a button. Wait, what? Manderly makes it clear that the higher-ups are keeping an eye on him, and they are sending him immediately to Hong Kong to kill Paul's contact, Tracer Tong. Before leaving, we can walk in on Jaime, talking to this guy about his nano augmentation, and he finally introduces himself as Walton Simons, the director of FEMA, and he becomes quite incensed when JC dares prod why the director of FEMA would need such enhancements for pushing pencils. I do like that everyone in UNATCO, save for Manjali and Gunther, is willing to give you and Paul the benefit of the doubt. Even Jaime humors that Paul must have had good reason to leave, positing that Versalife, the pharmaceutical company that creates the vaccine, could be significant to this alleged conspiracy. At the helipad, even Jock proves his loyalty to Paul and takes you not to Hong Kong, but Paul's apartment building because his kill switch is slowly shutting his body down. He stands a chance of surviving if they can get him to Tracer Tong, but first Paul asks if JC can break into an NSF facility that is now under the control of United and send out a distress signal to the other NSF silhouette and terrorist groups. This base is also protecting a data cube that includes enough dirt on Walton Simons to prove both the NSF and silhouette's innocence in the Statue of Liberty bombing as well as many other attacks. UNATCO was behind them, and then blamed both groups to vilify them in the eyes of the public. The poor UNATCO troops, so trusting, you can just walk up behind all of them and bonk them. You're not clear to be up here, Agent. Got it. Understood. Totally understand. <laughs> Sending the signal outs you as a traitor, and Simons orders everyone at the base to kill you. <laughs> Good thing I like bonking folk. Back 
Bracket Pauls, JC asks why Simons seems to have authority over UNATCO if he belongs to an organization meant for disaster relief. Paul explains that FEMA is just another front for Majestic 12 and part of how they plan to shut down the US government. There is another branching path here that I feel is a little counterintuitive and not as open-ended as some of the others. Your conversation is interrupted by men in black coming to kill both of you. Paul wants you to climb out the window and have Jock take you to Hong Kong as planned and he'll figure something out, uh, which you can do. But while trying to reach Jock, you'll be apprehended by an angry Gunther with a UNATCO team. You'll then wake up inside a UNATCO holding cell underneath their headquarters on Liberty Island and realize that the thing Paul figured out was how to be shot until you die. Or you could ignore Paul's instructions and stay and fight the men in black with him. The ideal outcome here, I think, is that you either die fighting with Paul or you kill all the enemies in the Taun and then make it to the trap set by Gunther. I've tried just fighting my way to Jock through all the soldiers, bots, and Gunther, but this is one of the few unfortunate occasions where they sort of railroad you and make an NPC invincible, even though you probably could have taken him. But either of these lead to both you and Paul being held in the UNATCO dungeon, ready to plot your escape. An escape made possible by a mysterious voice that seems to have tapped into your info link named Daedalus. Kinda weird that beneath the UNATCO base there are a bunch of dudes in black uniforms with a big 12 on them. Who do you think they're working for? What's their deal? Why the number 12? What are they... What are they... The, the number police? Oh, don't I? Hackers, coming up next. Paul and the NSF were right about this part, it seems. Making your way back to the UNATCO offices, you're hit with a moral conundrum. Do I kill all my former co-workers? Fulfill the American dream? Some of them seem like nice enough dudes. The guy at the front desk said he'd miss me last time I left. We'll miss you, Agent. Fuck you. Fuck you. You're okay. You're alright. Get, get back here. I don't want to kill you. I don't want to... Stop moving. All the main crew still support your decision. Alex considers meeting up with you in Hong Kong. Jaime can do the same, or you can ask him to stay behind as a mole. Sam even opens up the armory for you to plunder it. This is also where you'll technically be forced to kill Anna, if you haven't already. She's weirdly the only character in the whole game whose death is mandatory in order to progress the story. After Manderly is dead, I said that like it's the only option when I, I'm actually not sure. I just never imagined a world where I don't blow him up or something. After you kill him, he gets a holographic phone call from Simons, who thanks you for taking out their trash and then informs you that your kill switch has now been activated, giving JC 23 hours to live. Faithful to Paul, Jock continues to help out JC in Unaco stealth copter. Hong Kong is the next hub area for you to explore and accept missions, but the main objective is to make contact with Tracer Tong. The biggest obstacle is the active war between two triad gangs, the Luminous Path and the Red Arrow. The Chinese military police have a strong presence in the area, but they are largely in the pocket of the triad and do very little to squelch the rash of bombings and public hits. What they did do was install acoustic sensors all over the streets of Hong Kong that alert the police when gunshots are detected, forcing the gangs to resort to sword-based combat. Gordon Quick of the Luminous Path offers to take you to Tong if you prove your loyalty and help them bring about a truce between the triad. They believe a woman named Maggie Chow stole a high-tech sword prototype called the Dragon's Tooth Sword from the Red Arrow, a sword they had first stolen from Versalife. She then killed the Red Arrow leader and then blamed the Luminous Path and he wants you to find proof. A femme fatale type, through and through, Maggie very convincingly feigns innocence, but you can easily stumble upon a secret room guarded by Majestic 12 troops, and inside, the Dragon's Tooth Sword. Depending on whether or not you confront her about this, she may have been able to escape, or you can, I don't know, you just throw her out of a window or some shit. We're fucking unemployed, like, who gives a shit anymore? We make two rules now, baby. I always thought it was interesting that Maggie says she knows Paul intimately, but you can't really pry any further into what kind of relationship they had. It was only way later that I learned that there was an explanation, though because it comes from cut content, it might not exactly be canon. Early design documents detail a plotline where Maggie pretends to be Paul's wife in order to get his dead body transferred to Versalife so they can study him. There's even unused dialogue to this effect. 
It's a shame they didn't do more with this character because she is so anomalous. And there are only like three female characters in the game and I've already killed two of them. She's working for Majestic 12 and First Life while also being a famous actress and owning part of the Lucky Money Club and doesn't express any particular allegiance to any of these factions. No, oh well, out the window! Anyway, you present the sword to the new Red Arrow leader, Max Chen, at Lucky Money and he agrees to a truce but Majestic 12 commandos show up and shoot up the place, meaning the luminous path will take you to Tracer Tong and you just get to keep the strongest weapon in the game. It's like everyone's so relieved that the air has been cleared, they don't mind that they left some guy with an instant death lightsaber. Down in Tong's secret lab, he explains that he can save you, but you'll owe him. Will you and Alex, who managed to track down Tong before you, wonder if he had to steal the lightsaber too? Oh, he just met him on fucking 4chan and then they met up? That's cool. That's one way to do it, I guess. Yeah. Tong deactivates JC's kill switch and the two talk for a bit. Tong wants to cash in his favor right away. In order to maintain balance among the triad, he wants JC to break into Versa Life and steal the schematics for the Dragon's Tooth Sword so that both gangs can have it. I can't imagine how life in Hong Kong would be improved with several of these things in circulation, but a deal is a deal. Afterwards, they can work together to take down Majestic 12. There's a couple ways to get into the Versa Life lab, the easiest being paying off an employee to give you a guest pass. But when you get down there, it is kind of surreal. I, I skipped over it, but the game opens with a cutscene showing two men you don't know. Well, we know one of them now is Simons, but they vaguely plot and conspire with each other in a red marble room with a giant sculpture of a hand hovering over the earth. So you walk into this room and it kind of hits you that like, oh shit, I'm, I'm probably much further beyond the looking glass than I realized. The path to the sword data is made of these glass tunnels that allow you to look over all the wild shit Versa Life gets up to, like the production of Grey Death and Ambrosia but most intriguingly to me, what appears to be some kind of alien autopsy in progress. Just to me though, none of the other characters seem to give a fuck about that part. I think the knowledge that sentient alien life was confirmed, you know, gray skin, almond eyes, the whole shebang, would fundamentally change my worldview. I would... I don't even know. Do something, read more. Tong wants you to get back into Verse Life through a back entrance, but this time go deeper into those labs and retrieve some kind of blueprint for the virus and its vaccine so he can duplicate it. While crawling through the sewers to get back, Daedalus contacts us again and rather bluntly explains that inside the Verse Life building is a big machine called a Universal Constructor, one of only two in the world and the only thing that can manufacture the Great Death virus. He suggests we blow it up while we're down there. On your way to do this, if you didn't throw Maggie out of a window, she may confront you here and attempt to stop you. But luckily, at the moment, you're the only one with a motherfucking lady. What? In the data we send back to Tong, we find out that the majority of Grey Death that's been manufactured is being kept on a freighter once owned by someone named Stanton Dowd, a man Tong knows to be associated with the Illuminati, a once powerful group of conspirators that sought to take advantage of the weakened US government to push them towards the ultimate goal of a unified world government. What remains of their leadership resides in France. JC also brings up Daedalus to Tong, who doesn't know who it is but thanks them for helping track down the freighter's location. Back in New York, JC meets with the paranoid Stanton Dowd, who tells you that the freighter would have to be at a naval submarine yard near Brooklyn, and he also gives detailed instructions on how to destroy it, as they share a common enemy in Majestic 12. As always, there are a number of ways you could approach this base, but my favorite is just to befriend this navy guy named Vinny in the Underworld Tavern. Seeing as FEMA, aka Majestic 12, just kinda showed up and assumed command of their base and refused to answer their questions, all the guys that work there are just dying to know what the heck they're doing there. So after talking to Vinny, you get in no problem by just dropping his name. And even though you're killing dozens of people and blowing up the ship they're supposed to be working on, they're just like, Hey, you know Vinny, right? Hey, that's cool, you know, Vinny. Some important updates while we blow this freighter up. Gunther has been hot on our heels since we escaped Unatco, likely thirsty to avenge Anna Navarre's death. Also, Daedalus, seemingly up to date on everything we've been doing, explains that we need to go to Paris and meet up with someone named Morgan Everett, something Stanton later confirms should be JC's next step, as he is needed to help create the vaccine. Everett, along with someone named Bob Page, developed nano-augmentation technology, but Page, a former 
Illuminati council member that was one of the many that splintered off to form Majestic 12, chose to weaponize that technology as a virus. In order to find this Everett character, we have to find someone who knows him, a silhouette member named Nicolette Duclair. I love the tense atmosphere of this cemetery meeting. This is them nailing the whole conspiratorial thing, meeting in a mausoleum to talk about rival world domination schemes. The meeting, of course, leads to an ambush, something hinted at when you're led into the grounds by an unassuming gatekeeper, despite Dowd claiming nobody else should be here at this hour. I kind of wish we could live in that paranoia just a little longer. But in contrast to the other locations in the game, in France, Majestic 12 operates completely out in the open. They are literally an occupying military force, with soldiers and bots patrolling the streets. Paris is probably the largest hub area in the game, at least the most varied. It's also the most forgettable visually. I mean, in the moment, I'm loving it, but in my memory, all I see is a blurry image of a gray street, a brown tunnel, a house? I think there was a house. There was a house, wasn't there? Tell me there was a house. JC is contacted by another mysterious voice, this one going by the name Icarus, and sounding much more threatening and robotic than Daedalus. I like behind you, Mr. Denton. Who's this? Soon, I will be ahead of you, beside you. I will be a part of everything in your world. But... Who is the phone? We catch up to Nicolette Duclair at a nightclub, though she goes by an alias after her mother, an Illuminatus, was assassinated by Majestic 12. Nicolette brings JC to her childhood home. where they find a hidden room with some kind of experimental computer that allows untraceable communication. This is how her mother was able to keep in contact with Morgan Everett in secret and how JC gets a hold of him. For everything Deus Ex guesses right about the near future, like the Patriot Act, a pandemic in which people don't get vaccinated for very different reasons, I'm really charmed by things it either gets wrong or half right. It being so based on real life predictions and theories unavoidably, it's gonna, it's gonna get a couple of them right and seem prescient. The most well-known one being the omission of the World Trade Center from the New York skyline, a decision that was made entirely because of hardware limitation and many of the devs didn't even notice, but once pointed out they put a lower band-aid over it, claiming that the Twin Towers were destroyed in a terrorist attack. Unaware that just a year later it would actually be destroyed by the Illuminati, but there are little whoopsies that could only come about by looking ahead from the 90s. You can walk by a digital music store, but Tong tells you not to waste any money in it because you can get any music you want from a black market for two credits. So they were half right that physical media and brick and mortar locations are dying, but they also assumed the most ideal way you could attain music would be to go to a market where you'd get a discount, I guess. Little did they know that in order to combat people not paying artists, we would create a variety of streaming services that don't pay artists. As far as this technology that is used to circumvent Majestic 12's Aquinas Net, the thing they use to observe all internet traffic. I'm assuming is them trying to describe a VPN in sci-fi terms. It's like a device that generates a one-time use signal so they know when to meet face to face. It's like it's hard to fake fun stuff like this. Morgan Everett agrees to help JC if he helps him complete the vaccine by accessing the Majestic 12 computer network which is built into the Cathedral of the Knights Templar. Only a matter of time before those guys showed up. Nicolette claims that the Knights Templar were once the financiers of the Illuminati, creators of the modern banking system, thanks to all the gold and riches they hoarded during the Crusades. During their scattering of the Illuminati, Majestic 12 killed the Knights Templar for their gold reserves and set up shop in their cathedral. I think it's around here where your alliances start to become more and more murky. At first it was like, I'm with UNATCO, the goodies. But then the NSF, the guys we thought were the baddies, say UNATCO is actually on the real baddies payroll. Now I guess I work for them, but now you got Tracer Tong and Illuminati guys that want your help because we all want to stop Majestic 12, but for largely different reasons. This really hits home when you're sneaking into the computer network and Everett's like, So JC, when you find the data for the vaccine, if you could... Uh, oh, wait a minute. Hang on, is that all gold? That didn't pick up on my grade. At the Majestic 12 computer terminal, you're finally confronted by Gunther, who you can fight, but like just about any quote-unquote boss fight, 
in the game can also be easily subverted. Back when you escaped from Unatco, if you asked Jaime to stay on board as your man on the inside, you can meet up with him at a cafe in France where he reveals an interesting tidbit he dug up. The mech augmented agents had built-in kill phrases, a more immediate solution than Paul and JC's kill switch, which just duplicates their nanomachines so they spread like a cancer until they shut down. You could have also used one to defeat Anna with a little digging around. But I kind of just like uh, blowing her up. Oh, what can I say? So when Gunther emerges from the shadows to exact revenge, you can just say the phrase and he'll immediately explode. Simons once again taunts you over hologram and says that even if they do figure out the vaccine, they will need a universal constructor like the one we blew up in Hong Kong to produce enough of it, something only Bob Page has access to now. Pleased with your performance, Morgan Everett agrees to meet in person, but on the way both Bob Page and Icarus, which Morgan reveals is actually a Majestic 12 AI, hack into your info link to threaten and belittle you, call you a failure, a prototype, a dickhead, real piece of shit. With the new data, Everett is able to finish the work Tong started, but Daedalus, and even Alex, who is of course just here now, remind JC that the Illuminati aren't to be trusted. They are, after all, just another cabal of power-hungry technophiles. JC kinda intentionally doesn't hear Everett's excitement about the Illuminati being rebooted, and tries to keep him focused on the vaccine. His plan is to send JC to the Vandenberg Air Base to meet an ex-Area 51 scientist named Gary Savage who's working on building a universal constructor, which they still need. Having access to military intelligence equipment will also allow them to hopefully stop Icarus from destroying Daedalus, which is explained as another AI built by Majestic 12 that due to an error, classified Majestic 12 as a terrorist organization and has been working against them by helping us. And it's good he's on our side since he is essentially you know, omnipresent in all computers across the world. He's kind of like Internet Explorer. He's just always there, no matter how many times I seem to delete it. Some, sometimes he changes his name to Edge, and I'm just like, alright, I'll delete Edge, and then an Internet Explorer window pops up asking me to download Edge again, and then I just get frustrated and try not to think about it anymore. I would say that's the fear and obedience that arises from electronic surveillance, but it's more like the apathy that just allows it to continue unchecked. These power crystals will be sent to you free. You can head up to the roof and leave with Jock, or you can take a while to snoop around Everett's place and find several significant pieces of lore, one being the cryogenically preserved Illuminati leader Lucius de Bears, who is lucid enough but kept in a pod that keeps him alive and oblivious to Everett having snaked his position as Supreme Enlightened One in his absence. You can also find a secret room that triggers one of the most philosophically interesting discussions in the game, which is J.C. arguing arguing with a glorified AI novelty kiosk named Morpheus a data mining parlor trick the Illuminati created to entertain guests, but in the years since its creation, it has observed humanity enough to form uncannily insightful opinions about things, exhibiting far more awareness than an expensive magic eight ball should. No one will ever worship a software entity peering at them through a camera. The human organism always worships. First, it was the gods. Then, it was fame. The observation and judgment of others. Next, it would be the self-aware systems you have built to realize truly omnipresent observation and judgment. It's an intriguing choice that this scene, which seems to encapsulate so much of the game's themes in one conversation, is relegated to some locked room you might not even notice. It's a well-written exchange that more or less tells you what this game is about in pretty clear terms. God was a dream of good government. You will soon have your God. And you will make it with your own hands. This game is full of stuff like that. It's like you're rewarded for exploring with both items and plot. So check everywhere, especially bathrooms. Expecting a show. When we get to Vandenberg, it's already under attack by MJ-12. Icarus seems to be closing in on Daedalus, who implores you to give him access to the military computers so they can duke it out in cyberspace. Inside the base's labs, we find Sam Carter, who, like seemingly all our old UNATCO chums, has defected to the other side. If you stay up to date with the news kiosks found throughout the game, you can read about how JC, Alex, and Jaime all have an APB out on them. They sort of undersell JC's description, however, claiming he has silver facial tattoos and glowing eyes as the result of some kind of genetic disorder. I would have guessed it was uh, from gaming, all that blue light exposure. It's what I'm gonna look like in a few years, except it won't grant me any special abilities, just uh, blindness. They might take my driver's license away.
<laughs> Once we let Daedalus into the Millnet, he seems to merge with Icarus into a separate entity calling itself Helios, something Bob Page had clearly anticipated, but I don't think he nor Everett really knew who the new AI will side with. To add to this unfortunate turn, it never seems to end with this universal constructor bullshit, as this one was apparently built from tech stolen from Savage's time at Area 51, and it's missing a part they're gonna have to steal from the other constructor that Bob Page keeps in a secret sea lab. Upset that we foiled his attack on Vandenberg, Page kidnaps Savage's daughter, who was caught sneaking into the sea lab. So before heading to the sea lab, we gotta meet up with some MJ-12 guys at an abandoned gas station to make the trade off, or shooting all of them in the head. This area presents another one of those things that Deus Ex kinda calls but misses the mark. I remember the first time I played this, seeing the price of gas listed outside and being like, man, whew, pretty expensive. <laughs> <laughs> After picking up Savage's daughter, Jock drops JC off at the Sea Lab in Pasadena, and luckily things seem to be in a bit of disarray there after an Illuminati sleeper agent detonated some explosives and sabotaged much of the lab. The scientists on the shore station are really helpful in getting you a mini sub so you can reach it. You must be Denton. How? I've been in contact with Dr. Savage. Oh, hey, dude. Just, if you um, want to take one wait a minute. It's important to X-51 that I keep my position here. Whoever's... Oh, my God! Aside from the MJ-12 divers and environmental damages, this area really pits you against the game's creatures, which you've come up against a couple times, but not this frequently. These are aggressive, lab-grown creatures called Greasels, the green chicken-like guys that spit acid, and Karkians, the dinosaur-looking guys. They are entirely just the result of needlessly tinkering with life, and after the West Coast fell, they have pretty much become pests, setting up shop in sewers and tunnels. I mean, from a game dev perspective, they're there because they didn't want you just shooting guys and robots and robot guys the whole game. Still, I feel like they could have chosen less chill and adorable-looking critters. They didn't wish for this. Dear. They never asked for it. To be living their life and then have a guy in sunglasses beat them to death with a laser sword? Come on. Found documents and newspapers give us some insight to what's been going on globally during our adventure. Most notably, the President of the United States gave Walton Simons executive authority, whereupon he immediately fired the Secretary of Defense. Now several world leaders are refusing to acknowledge his power, leading to many protests and military forces abandoning their posts. As we get closer to finding this gizmo, Bob Page reveals that his plan is to have Helios interface with his own mind where he will have access to any computer and the universal constructor, making him a techno-Jesus of sorts, achieving the ultimate enlightenment of the Illuminati by interfacing with the collective knowledge of all life on the planet, giving him the divine right to rule the Earth. He's just got one hell of a progress bar before you can pull that off, so we've got time to uh, find out where he plugs in his router. We get the schematics for the constructor component, but so did Bob Page. So while the X-51 gang could get to work making the cure, Page could use the same technology to produce another strain of Grey Death. He also plans to launch a missile from Area 51 at Vandenberg. On the way out of the base, you run into Simons, who you'd think would be off being Super President or whatever. But he came down here to settle who has the better firmware. A fight that, in this playthrough, was probably the funniest fight I had. Uh, because he's just kind of standing in the distance when you enter this room, and then he runs toward you to initiate the conversation. But when I turned the corner here, I just assumed it was a man in black enemy, and panicked and threw an MP3 grenade. MP3 grenade? I threw him some music? No, I threw an EMP grenade, which seemed to distract him. Like his character model froze to watch it explode. So I just kind of walked up to him and bonked him on the head. Thankfully, everything the villains in this game try to do has a real inconvenient timed implement. So Jock flies us over to the missile silo that MJ-12 commandeered so they can redirect it to hit Area 51. Page is likely miles underground, but his defenses are crippled now. And schlocky as it may be, I'm, I'm always so excited that there is an actual payoff to the Area 51 baiting. You mean space aliens? We lost power when the missile hit. The cages, they came unlocked. You have a pretty clean shot at the surface if you leave now. No, no. Not until I see troops. How'd you get back here? This area is restricted. I was thinking about- Why aren't you talking about the aliens? It's bittersweet, I'll tell you that. Cause I like aliens. 
I mean, conceptually, the idea of them is so cosmically horrific that I don't think I'd know how to process even looking at one. But in a fun way, you know, it's like thinking about how we're all like little bugs crawling around under a rock, on a rock, on a rock, on a rock, on a rock, and it's awful. Anyway, aliens are tight. I'm excited to meet one. Well, see you later. So there are aliens. Well, not really. I guess I see why nobody seems to find them interesting. It's not like they came straight out of the saucer. They were cooked up in a lab, but that's still functionally like an alien, right? Come on. I do think it was a smart idea to include aliens as a smokescreen, essentially. As a means to distract and discredit. It's an interesting idea when paired with the game's penultimate area, a sort of incubation room where JC was cloned from Paul. Paul was chosen at the age of five for experimentation because of his intelligence and lack of congenital health issues. The two were raised as brothers by parents oblivious to the importance of both children to Majestic 12. It's narratively kind of fitting for the hero's journey that you return to the tube in which you were born at the end of the game. But also real interesting that there is another Denton left unactivated named Alex, star of the often maligned and, I think, misunderstood Deus Ex Invisible War. Don't listen to them. Your life has value and meaning. Your life as the rejected clone of a superior creation. Wait, that didn't come out right. That didn't come out. This final area is where you have to start thinking about which one of these characters yammering in your info link you want to side with, which is unavoidably a bit like choosing a political alignment. I feel like this game finishes strong and manages to be the best of all worlds at the end, and it's not as complex as it could be by modern standards, but not a lot of modern games aspire to even this. You won't be entering a room with three buttons that determine what cutscene you get, but it is a bit in the peripheral of that. You get to this final area and have three different objectives you can accomplish based on which of your allies best reflect how you think the world should be governed or reset, and I don't think there is anything preventing you from just getting to this area and reloading to see all of the endings. So while you can absolutely experience different story beats on the way here, it still lets you make the final call at the end. Tracer Tong will push you to initiate a meltdown at Area 51, which would kill Bob Page and Helios, but also destroy the Aquinas router that all communication is filtered through and plunge the world into something resembling a dark age, where internet communication wouldn't be possible. The Illuminati would be stamped out and the government would be decentralized. Or you could side with Everett, kill Bob Page and join the Illuminati, rule over the world in secret maintaining the status quo. The third option is to side with Helios, merge your mind with the combined knowledge of the world and rule over it as a cybernetic Christ figure, and hope that there is enough JC left in there to have his rule be a benevolent one. Though all of them are in their own way canon, that last one is probably my favorite despite being the most authoritarian in nature I guess. You literally just become a machine god, and I don't know, I'm sure he's got some great ideas provided all of the knowledge that Helios mind wasn't just bread tubers, but he also like, you know, read some theory. It's also just the most disruptive and unknowable ending, until you play the sequel, I guess. So unfortunately for some, this game does fulfill the gamer's nightmare and includes politics. However, I don't think Deus Ex is a game that outright expresses a pointed political opinion, but one is inherently there. Obviously, I'm gonna maybe read into it too much and say it is a reflection of my own beliefs, but I don't think it intends to depict left or right theory as more favorable. Ion Storm mostly stayed true to the design document and made JC a nearly blank slate for you to make decisions with while spending the length of the game being confronted with questions from a number of different perspectives. So in that way, it tries to be left, right, and center. In a Rock Paper Shotgun interview, Warren Spector shares an anecdote about being confronted at a bar after a talk in a college by two students, one upset that he wrote a game about right-wing propaganda, and one baffled that the other didn't read it as left-wing, saying, the fact is they were both right, I guess, based on how they'd played. I was really tickled by that. It comes with the territory of a cyberpunk story that we'd hit themes of social change, wealth disparity, capitalism, socialism, fascism, the lower classes turned against each other, corporations overreaching and creating technology used to control, terrorism, police militarization. A government shouldn't have to occupy its own country with troops. If there wasn't organized oppression, there wouldn't be organized resistance, and what you call terrorism would not exist. But you can tell what the team really got off on was making the player make up their own mind about something. Even now, you can see that they're still proud that they were able to pull that off. We are our choices. Yes. We are our choices. 
Yeah, that yeah, sums up yeah, the game right there. Choosing the fate of the world is obviously something you might want to sleep on, but I sort of immediately knew which path I wanted to take, and I'd imagine that could be vastly different from someone else's playthrough. Re-establishing the Illuminati would return us to the same capitalism that got us here, the only difference being we are made an underling to a bunch of nerds with god complexes overseeing it. It's essentially a quick load to the start of the game. Nothing is different. Tight. Siding with Everett feels like the bad ending, and it feels like you've done something selfish when it recreates the game's opening cutscene with JC and Everett in place of Simons and Paige. Tracer Tong is a good enough guy, and his heart is probably in something approximating the right place. He wants to help people, he wants to end tyranny, but he wants to do that by paralyzing what he thinks the catalyst of tyranny is the internet. I guess he does have a point. But he just wants to cut the head off of the snake, and in a world so reliant on computers, severing that link could potentially cause all manner of pain and suffering. What about hospitals and infrastructure and all those people with robot parts in them? What if our augmented limbs keep making us T-pose and we need a firmware upgrade, but all our shit's offline? What he describes as the outcome is his dream, but it seems more realistic that this would be a temporary setback for everyone. Pretty soon someone's gonna find the internet box and turn it back on. God, can you imagine a world without the internet? Going to a video store and renting a, a, a tape, seeing people in person, sitting on the couch with your family to watch some good old Comedy Central. There are a lot of things that probably wouldn't work if you wrote Deus Ex 2000 today because it was written at a time when conspiracy theories were still just kind of neat. Harvey Smith would later say, you can look back and vaguely remember when conspiracy theories were just amusing and not terrifying examples of people engaging in delusional magic reality thinking and doing hurtful things or families losing people. In a recent interview, Spectre would imply that the life conspiracy theories have taken on since Deus Ex makes him unsure if he would even make the game today. Funnily enough, he would also detail some ideas cut from the game for being too silly, like a connection between aliens and and Nazi secret societies, showing his ability to not only predict world events, but 99% of the History Channel's programming. When the Germans got to Antarctica, what they found were massive cities that were highly technological. This game has a strong finish and does a lot with its characters. You get a lot more freedom in the game's first half and have a lot more downtime where you can get to know your Unatco buddies, and it was always a pleasure seeing them pop up in surprising places. Unfortunately, the character that gets the most short shrift is Paul. His borderline omission from the game's second half is something Ionstorm admits as one of the game's failings. They just didn't know how to insert this character into the story in a meaningful way if he could also die in the middle of it. So outside a scene in the final level, he's suspiciously absent from the game's perilous conclusion. In an already complex game with plot variables to juggle, it does sound like a challenge to write the game with Paul both as a vital character and one that could be dead through most of it. I, it still stings though. I'd still be wandering around thinking, wish Paul had my back right now. He's so cool. Ending with JC becoming a machine god just feels like the most appropriate bow to put on this story. There's a lot of subtext in the game that foreshadows that we're headed there. One of them, which is not the most well telegraphed concept in the game, but it does seem really on the nose in retrospect, is a few times in the game they refer to the hierarchy within Majestic 12 as modeled after the firmament. Back at Unatco, Simons asks you, You're beginning to exceed your clearance. What are you? Angel OA? Angel OA is the lowest clearance level within MJ-12. It means JC is to be kept the most in the dark about the conspiracy, implying that as he gained trust, he would rise in the ranks and also ascend to some kind of divinity and gain other clearances like Archangel and Throne. This is why Paul mentions that one who is able to activate an agent's kill switch has God clearance. You've got to have God clearance to to know. That is the way the Illuminati and MJ-12 view their efforts as some sort of spiritual battle as well. It goes back to what Morpheus says via a Voltaire quote about man needing to invent a god in the absence of one. And that's what JC ultimately achieves. He becomes the god from um, something. I don't know. We'll never know. God from the tube. We can't be no longer free to join with you. And if I do, what becomes of me? Maybe you're afraid, like, are you a computer person? No, I'm not. I'm, I don't like the, that would be like changing my sex or my political affiliation. I'm not, that's a whole new, 
I'm not that person. Uh, Deus Ex is old, and it is unquestionably a product of its time, released when the coolest thing in the world was a guy in a trench coat and sunglasses tearing down a conspiracy, which yes, ages it. Its choice of subject matter and its aesthetic are instantly recognizable as old. And I instinctively want to say something like, oh, but you have to consider the time it came out, what other games were doing, how it was, how it pushed the industry forward, which I would stand by, but on top of that, I would say it's still incredibly rare that a modern game even aspires to accomplish something like what Deus Ex did. There is plenty to criticize about the game's storytelling. You could say its characters are all kind of wooden, and some story beats are predictable, or some dialogue is boring, or you just can't get over how old it is or what it looks like. I can understand that. I mean, I can't, but I can pretend like I do. The AAA space seems to have less and less room for games with this much heart and frankly hubris. There was nothing safe about the production of Deus Ex. It was a gamble, a pipe dream of a genre Frankenstein that would confront you with big ideas. Everything that publishers hate, every immersive sim since, including the sequels to this game, have just been creators poking that first bottle of lightning and saying, how'd they get that in there? Are they use like magnets or something? I guess a magnet. I still think this game has a great story that is on its surface, you know, not mind-blowingly different from a lot of cyberpunk media. There's a lot of familiar ingredients, a little X-Files, a dash of the Matrix, and a dollop of system shock, but it makes an admirable attempt at saying something, at providing you with sharply written philosophical and political dilemma, along with the smorgasbord of conspiracy theories, which is admittedly pretty extensive and intricately woven together. And so much of the joy of the story comes from how it's presented and how it can be sort of bent but not broken. There are so many small actions you can take that the game keeps track of and amends the dialogue to reflect. Also, you can mess up or fail at doing something, but this does not lead to a fail state. For example, there's a mission where you have to rescue someone captured by an enemy faction, and the gimmick of the level is if you're spotted trying to break in, they'll execute the prisoner. But even if they do, it's not like the game is over, there is just different writing set in place that takes that into account. At the end of Deus Ex, you are locked into making three choices Choices, but it treats all three with remarkable restraint and sincerity. You never get the sense that the developer favors one as the correct canon ending. You will have formed your own opinion on the characters and their ideologies, and as I did earlier, assign them in alignment. All three have merits and consequences that are just the result of making such a huge decision. Even with its limitations, it packs so much world building and atmosphere into these compact hub areas that are supposed to represent whole cities crushed into a cube that amounts to like two blocks. It's probably smaller than a Tony Hawk level, but there is so much life and care built into them. God, the, the vibe. The vibes, I tell you. Walking around the streets of New York with steam billowing out of sewer grates and rats scurrying around piles of trash. It's like I'm there, fighting one for a slice of sweet, sweet street pizza. Or just hanging out at the UNADCO base, following around the little Roombas. Another thing I think they predicted, but that I won't look up as to not shatter my excitement. The neon lit alleyways of Hong Kong, getting straight hustled outside the Lucky Money Club, not even getting a dance out of it. The eerie permanent dawn on the horizon in California. I'm saying it's got flavor, it's got texture, it's got mouthfeel. Shooters did not do this. With few exceptions, shooters were essentially mazes full of enemies where you won if you got to the end of the maze. But this was the first game I had played where you can take your time familiarizing yourself with the location and its inhabitants and variables within it change based on your actions. I appreciate how many strange side characters you can come across that aren't pivotal to the plot and most of which you can't do more than exchange a line of dialogue or with, but they make the world feel lived in, and they make up so many of my memories of Deus Ex. If someone brings up this game, my first thought might be, Oh my god, daddy! What a shame. He can't really be... There must be something we can do. He was a good man. What a rotten way to die. But there's an equal chance that what will spring to mind will be, Green crazy crazers. Ah! Or, I spill my drink. Every area in this game has that one NPC that really stays with you. Shannon, look, I'm a secret agent. Okay, I sneak around, I look in places for items. You, you wouldn't get it. Oh, fuck. Hi, it's your buddy Chad. Hey, Chad, you ever find those mole people? Yeah, I clean the place out. I never thought I'd see this much action in one mission. Something wrong? No, I just. I, I feel like we're having some kind of miscommunication. Sure. So you had a good night? It was sick. What are you working on? Uh, it's kind of like a retrospective of a video game. Uh, you much of a gamer there, Chad? Oh, 
Sure. Fortnite. Well, not quite that, but I I see that you know what a video game is. But this project, I don't know, it's it's just it's far too long and I'm, I'm afraid to show it to anyone. Sounds like a picture-perfect description of my pianist. That's good stuff, Chad. Uh, was there a reason you interrupted me? I want you to tell me what you know about love. Mm, what's going on, bud? I'm asking the questions. Having a little trouble making a connection lately. So, I give up. All the hours I spent dreaming about being held. I don't know, why don't you set up like a Tinder account or something? Yeah, maybe I'll look into it now. Wait a minute. Let's see the hardware. Um, so you won't be referring to these people as hardware in person, right? Mm. Swipe. No, oh, he's, he's swiping away. No thanks. I'll pass. You don't look that bad. Hmm. Actually, I could use this. What do you mean? Nothing. What's your profile like? Her name's Tiffany. That's nice. You gonna set up a date or something? Sounds like fun. I can take out a booby. Okay, but you can't just do that. What's the first move? You could talk to them first, maybe? Treat them like a human? Now, what's your opening line? Hmm. I have a pretty big weapon mod down there, if you know what I mean. Chad, what the fuck, dude? I'm too loaded. I'll check back with you later. Yeah. That's probably a good idea. In the most plainest sense, Deus Ex is a first-person adventure game with stealth RPG and shooter elements. The majority of the game places you in hub areas that you can explore and pick up side tasks in while trying to accomplish one or two main tasks. Completing tasks awards you with XP and sometimes augmentation canisters. XP can be spent to upgrade your skills like your ability to use certain weapon types, lock picking, hacking, and so forth, while the canisters are used to unlock special abilities granted by JC's nano augmentation, like super strength, night vision, and even the ability to shoot a drone out of your eyeball. All of these can in turn be upgraded using augmentation upgrade canisters. These abilities can provide wildly different experiences depending on the combination you choose. Using them, however, drains your bioelectric energy quickly, especially if an ability is at a lower level. So you'll need to find a bioelectric cell or a repair bot to refill it. As you near the end of the game, it begins to narrow into linearity, but there's a surprising wealth of things to discover before you even get there. So much so that with just about every playthrough, I find myself walking down an alley I never noticed or finding a secret cache of items I couldn't access before. Exploration is important, as it's the only other way you receive XP. There are aspects of Deus Ex's controls and UI that are just timeless. Love me a grid inventory. Love having it strategically packed with everything I need to the point where every time a character tries to hand me something something, I have to drink a soda or throw a knife on the floor. There are some functions I absolutely never touched, like you can take notes in the goals menu, presumably to write down passwords or login information, but you also get a record of every conversation you had, which includes those things. Oh, how's this for a completely worthless criticism? One of the pre-installed augments you get is a headlamp thing, which you need to use a lot because Deus Ex is a pretty dark game, and you're going to spend a lot of time in the shadows, but you turn that on by pressing F12, which on Steam takes a screenshot. Some Something I would have changed, but the mod I installed to allow the game to be playable in my monitor's resolution kept fucking up every time I tried to change the settings, so I just had to accept that I was racking up an impressive collection of unnoteworthy screenshots, mostly of ventilation shafts, something I felt guilty about because obviously it shows up in my recording uh, that I'm using for the video, but I felt less guilty about it when I watched a video Warren Spector and two of the other devs posted to promote Deus Ex Mankind Divided, where they play the original and do the same fucking thing. Great minds make the same boomer ass mistake. Playing the game stealthily is my preferred way of playing it. The game's still impressive level design allows for a number of fun ways to infiltrate buildings. You can crawl through sewer tunnels or bust open a ventilation shaft or just wait for a patrolling guard to look the other way and pick the lock on the front door. A mixture of correctly spent skill points, aiming, and luck can allow you to quietly take down enemies, hide their bodies, avoid security cameras and bots without raising alarms. Of course, the option to ignore stealth entirely was important to the game game's creative director, so it is a valid way to play through the game. I chose not to do this because open shootouts are not something Deus Ex nails exactly. Your accuracy with a gun is increased the longer you're standing still and keeping your reticle on an enemy, so it does seem to favor patience. Otherwise, it's just going to be two dudes standing in front of each other, emptying mags and barely hitting anything. The most brazen thing I'd do was throw a gas grenade to get a group of enemies stuck in place and then pick them off with a rifle. Other than that, I prefer to lure them away from groups and 
whack him over the head one by one. I criticize this game sort of lovingly, and it's just this weird characteristic of my admiration for it, because the strangest feat Deus Ex pulls off in its attempt to be the best of all genres at once is that it individually fails at distilling the greatness of any one genre, yet the combined effort manages to produce a game that is still loads of fun to play even now. You could point to a number of games that Deus Ex borrows themes, plot points, ideas, and design principles from, but the real goal of this game was to get as close to immersive simulation as could be done at the time, a game that does as much as it can to hide its programming, to prevent traditional game things like an interface or stat sheet from reminding you that you're playing a game. Obviously, I don't know how attainable that is even now. Try as I might, I always remember that I'm tethered to this cruel form in a world where I have to give two-thirds of my money to a fucking landlord and spend the rest on soup. But even this goofy looking 20 year old game allows you, encourages you even, to develop your own personalized playstyle. You can also just learn new things about it and new things you can do. Even this time around, I would think, I wonder if I could jump from the rafters onto an enemy and drive a knife into their back. I feel like there is a ritual to playing Deus Ex, one that you will no doubt take part in on your first playthrough, and one that I admit I still fall into on every new install. It begins on that Liberty Island dock. Paul offers you a third weapon in addition to your pistol and stun prod, a precursory decision with as much significance as Neo being offered two color-coded gel capsules, the mini crossbow, the sniper rifle, or the explosive launching GEP gun. For a new player, you might be thinking, well, Paul here, he's my brother, he's telling me to minimize casualties, he's telling me to be sneaky and save my bullets. I'll go with the crossbow, it's got tranquilizer darts. And for me, I'm thinking, this one. This, this is gonna be the one. This is gonna be the playthrough where I do my pacifist run and don't kill a single person aside from the one that they forced you to kill. Just because it's funny to set a proximity mine in the doorway as she enters the room. Jesse ben. Give me that crossbow, bro! My brother! My blood! My family lights out, dickhead. Pig. Oh shit! God. I usually make it to around Hong Kong before I just relent and start blasting dudes. So this time, I broke the cycle and accepted that it just feels right taking lives. And a big reason for that is there's no real reward for being a pacifist and no penalty for being a murderer. In the beginning, I wanted to try using strictly non-lethal weapons because I disagreed with Anna's methods and I was sparing people's lives out of spite, essentially. But most of the time, it's just more reasonable to take down an enemy with a headshot than allow them an opportunity to limp over to an alarm button, or sometimes not go down in one whack. Because on one hand, it is important to the idea of Deus Ex that the game not slap you on the wrist for your decisions. The developers speaking through the game are not going to say what you did was bad. Characters within it might, or they may commend you, but that would seem like something gamey, something immersion breaking by their logic, like a black and white morality system that goes up or down depending on who you save or kill. A mechanic I've long been on the fence about and rarely find implemented in an interesting way. I wanted your choices to say more about you, the player, the human, with you know your hands on a keyboard and a mouse or a controller. I wanted the, 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 the choices to say more about you than they did about your in-game avatar. I don't care about your puppet. I care about you. Somebody kill me. Anybody. But I do think it should have made more room for that route. It's too prevalent within dialogue and gameplay, like it wants you to do it. They never stop giving you trank darts and stun prod batteries, but aside from the, I don't know, feeling of moral integrity it may grant you, it seems like a lot of extra work and save scumming for something that doesn't produce a lot of in-game difference. Why the guy make killing dudes and finding creative ways of doing so so enjoyable? I guess that's my real complaint. And once you get the instant death machine that is the dragon's tooth sword, like, it's over. Why use anything else? Honestly, the weapon is so overpowered, I, I almost do think they should have limited it in some way. Maybe have it also drain bioelectric energy or something. It is kind of exhilarating turning your camo on, then sprinting over to an enemy, cutting them down, then running back to the shadows to turn off the camo as it drains super fast. Even boss fights can be bypassed in fucking phenomenal ways.
slap mid-sentence saying, You can't stop me. I have unlimited power. It's like the same rules and physics apply to every character in the game. Maybe some will be more resilient to bullets or a crowbar, but anybody can be blowed up, including... This is one of few franchises in all of video games where not only can you blow up kids, they recorded an amazing pitched up death scream for just such a scenario. I can tell them you're a spy and they will kill you. <laughs> I'm not saying I derived some kind of sick entertainment out of that, but... We got her payment. <laughs> What they say? If you kill this kid, they recorded dialogue t telling you it's okay that you did that and you can keep playing the game. If I didn't have explicit orders from Tong, I would kill you right now. Never, never again will that happen. I feel like I should examine why the only time this game makes me feel shame or guilt is when I accidentally step on a rat. They're such good rats. Also, fun fact about them, they originally had a bit more functionality besides being adorable. They apparently were set up to be able to bite you and had the ability to swim. A canceled detail survived only by this gif of the cruelly omitted swimming animation. Look at that guy. Look at his little nubs. According to interviews with the developers, there was a ton of content, some that would have had a huge effect on the entirety of the game that had to be cut out for one reason or another. They stuck to this rule that if they couldn't get something working and it was becoming a time sink, they'd just axe it. This included huge set pieces like a secret base beneath the Denver airport, which is the subject of numerous conspiracy theories, but also an apparently pretty accurate recreation of the White House using the building's actual blueprints as a guide. That level was a big part of early Deus Ex, even when it was called Shooter. It was the first level they created for the game, and apparently they showed it off at E3 1999. The problem that led to it being removed was that they couldn't figure out how to make exploring it seamless. It would have had to be cut into different segments with loading screens, and Spectre didn't want to compromise on his dream of a freely explorable White House. Disappointing that they couldn't figure it out, but also, it seems like you had this rat figured out, so like, what's up with that? Incidentally, I just for the heck of it, sat through a dozen Minecraft potato quality VHS rips of E3 1999 uh, in hopes that somebody so much as swept their camera past an Ion Storm booth, but I guess uh, all these gamers were more interested in console shit or like, please, don't do this. Every time I watch one of these, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, not anyway. The emergent nature of the gameplay is the lightning, the freedom that other games often fail to capture even when copying Deus Ex's answers. It's so effective that when they take it away from you, it feels genuinely disappointing. The rare occasion when they don't want you to do something by like giving you a door you can't lock, pick, hack, or break down feels unfair. It's like, but I can do this normally. I swear this never happens to me. These situations aren't very common, you just notice when they happen. For the most part, that freedom is always there and the game's feed back from your choices is a lot of fun. A scene that a lot of people who probably haven't played the game know, thanks to memes, is the what a shame scene, which is a good example of how varied even simple tasks can be. This is a side mission you can take part in where the owner of a rundown hotel and his daughter are being terrorized by a local gangster named Jojo Fine. The perhaps overprotective owner wants to protect his daughter, Sandra, from abuse at the hands of Jojo, but she sees life working in the hotel as miserable and wants to just bail and leave town. Understandable because it's just a scummy rundown hotel populated by criminals and junkies. She's like nothing but dead bodies and fucking upstairs. You walk in on her threatening to leave when Jojo takes up residence in the hotel. You can try to resolve the tension by killing Jojo yourself, but that would do nothing to show Sandra that her father could look after her. So what else could you do? Give the guy a weapon so he can step up and protect her. As noble as that is, it is sort of left to the game's programming, and more often than not, Jojo will kill him resulting in the famous exchange. So you can work out an in-between, give him the gun, but also take a couple shots at Jojo yourself. Sandra is impressed enough that he tried to fight for her and she agrees to stay a little longer. So there's lots of ways this could play out, and lots of ways you could just completely fuck it up. No, 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 don't shoot her. Let's see you get past this, buddy. Oh! 
Get him. Get him. God, you fucking oh. suck, dude. Oh, no, where do you think you're going? Oh. I'm trying to help you out of here. Oh. Where'd he go? He's still in the hotel. Cards on the table, I did let him die because the only gun I had on me was my silenced pistol that I had modded to shit and he doesn't give it back to you afterwards. So, weapon mods are interesting. It's a very early depiction of something that has become pretty standard in modern shooters. They do feel a bit like an afterthought and mostly amount to you incrementally increasing the amount of ammo a magazine can hold, its accuracy or adding a laser sight or suppressor to certain weapons. Often you can barely perceive the change, but it is still a charming novelty nonetheless. There are a lot of flavor items that don't actually do much of anything besides facilitate role playing. Maybe at one point there was more functionality to this, but as it stands, they just really like listening to JC ask for things like a can of soda. Can of soda, please. Or a candy bar. A candy bar, please. <laughs> I don't know why. It's just. It's kind of funny. You can smoke cigarettes, drink wine, eat soy food, even buy some Zyme off a dealer, a synthetic street drug that you shouldn't get mixed up in. Most of the depressing homeless characters seem to be hooked on it and wander around whimpering, moaning, or asking you for some. Don't have any Zyme. Just a little bit. A crumb. I said you're out of luck. Because I'm already high <laughs> shit, dude. <laughs> Oh, hey man, I got something here. Check that, check that. I feel like, as usual, the majority of this segment will just be me defending the way an old game looks. So unsurprisingly, I think this game looks great. It's very blocky, very chunky. You know, characters are sort of stuck with that static facial expression, claw hands, but I never feel like its limitations are distracting. I noticed even in early reviews, there would be some criticism lobbed at the way the game looked, which I can recognize. There were games from the year 2000 that maybe had some more detailed textures or more animation in their character models, but those were games that were far more linear and simple. Compared to early promo footage of Deus Ex, a lot of areas wound up looking comparatively sparse, drab, barren. This is something I will concede to, but there are a ton of design choices that I adore. The abundance of digital screens with sci-fi readouts and jargon in Tracer Tong's computer lab, the weird perspective bending mirrors in the Paris nightclub, the depressing dystopian bullpen at Versa Life headquarters. It's full of eye-catching and creative visuals that stand out in my mind more than some of the unfurnished, concrete rooms you may find yourself in. Something I never really noticed but that made me laugh hysterically was how disproportionate some of the game's assets were. Some things were wildly oversized compared to character models, but you don't really notice until you stop and stare and try to render what you're looking at in reality. I mean look at little Jaime. His little feet dangling off the ground. Look at that bottle of wine. How's he gonna fizzle hands around that to take a drink? Despite its visual failings, it is a game that has so many victories that I rarely notice things that were probably left half-baked. The character design is great. This is exactly like my fucking sweet spot. It already had this edgy 90s comic book vibe, and then you know that The Matrix coming out a year before had a profound effect on the game's aesthetic. You look at old concept art for JC, and then you look at one's post-Matrix, and you can just tell they were sitting in the theater like, that's it, baby. That's the secret ingredient. They even mocked up an homage to the Matrix poster when the game appeared on the cover of Game Design Magazine. Sound design is a big deal to me, and there is so much great work with sound in this game. And even the stuff that's bad <laughs> is pretty great. Everything from equipping a weapon to drinking a soda pop has a really unique and satisfying sound accompanying it. I have a weird relationship with video game sound effects. I don't think it's like an ASMR kind of thing. It's just that when they click with me, it's like a hit of dopamine when I hear it. When I pop a bioelectric cell in. Ooh. Some of them I just like because they're a good recording of a real thing. I always have a goddamn knife. I have one exception to this though. I'll admit, I've always felt like the dragon's tooth sword both sounds and looks like a toy you'd find in a dollar store. It looks like it's made of plastic, and weirdly, it sounds like it's made of plastic when you hit people with it. 
oh cool another knife and yet they seem to die pretty quickly so it's a, it's a weird uh, dissonance it makes this like piercing slap sound that is louder than anything else in the game for some reason I don't know, it's, it's the only bit of the game's design that had me thinking like, huh, well, that's a choice. I've got nothing but good to say about this game's soundtrack. It's perfectly one with every part of it. It's a strand in its DNA, and it was not the sole output of one composer, but four. The majority of it, including the iconic main theme, you know, the melody that gets referenced in other tracks, was written by Alexander Brandon, and he would show up in all of the following Deus Ex games, with the exception of Mankind Divided. A Michel Vandenbos was also responsible for a number of memorable tracks like the Unatco theme, which is probably the first song that comes to mind other than the main theme. I'm not certain, but I think every area in the game seems to have like four variations of a vibe and melody. There is one that plays while you're exploring. A different variation when you're in a conversation. Another when you're in combat. And finally, when you die. And they range from light, atmospheric, synth wavy, ambient stuff to more cinematic, Blade Runner y film score kind of stuff, but always with a cyberpunk slant, like a thumping beat. Sometimes it's just like outright techno, especially in the bars and clubs you come across. I don't think there's a single dud in the bunch or track that I got sick of. The music in the MJ12 lab adds so much tension and paranoia to creeping around. I swear you could just rename the soundtrack like music to sneak into clandestine facilities. It's just exactly what it needs to be. So undoubtedly, a big part of Deus Ex and its legacy, its renown, is its voice acting. Mainly the performance of the lead character, but I feel like you could include most of it. I'm noticing something I do a lot to ease my way into saying, I just like something about an old game is to preface it by saying it's bad I know but I won't do that because I think JC Dent's voice is one of the best parts of the game I'm not gonna stand here and listen to you badmouth the greatest democracy the world has ever known he's voiced by J. Anthony Frank, who four years before Deus Ex was known primarily for his role on the NBC family sitcom California Dreams, where he played, shockingly, a sociopath in a leather jacket. Hey Tiff, wanna catch a movie tonight? No thanks, I've got a date. Oh yeah? Well, who is he? Where's he taking you? Does he kiss on the first date? But JC's voice, like, it's fucking incredible, dude. It's just delightful for many reasons, some of which I'm sure were intentional and others I'm not so sure about. Saw him cut his face one time just so he'd look mean. Maybe I'll cap his ass, too. I've seen articles make mention of some War Inspector interview where he's explained JC's monotone and often disaffected performance as completely intentional, as an attempt to keep the player immersed in place of JC. The rationale being, I think, that were JC to be very expressive and have a clearly defined personality, it would no longer feel like you're the hero of Deus Ex. The great thing about this explanation is that I do think that is true, and that they did this somewhat effectively, but they just as easily could have thought up that response after they recorded his voice and it just worked out. I know it's often the butt of a joke, but it's also like a keystone of this whole thing. You, you take out JC's complete disregard for social cues and context, and I think the whole game crumbles apart. Hey baby, what's your name? JC. Mmm, mysterious. Want to know my initials? How about you tell me something about the people who come here? You remove the breathing or mouth sounds left in between lines, and what do you have left? A game that betrayed what it set out to do. I took care of the generator. How's the raid going? Most of the other main characters, it's clear that they, at the very least, know how to act. How to project their voice or put on a character. They probably had a few credits before the game. But some of them, and a lot of the NPCs, have clearly uh, less presence, less command of a performance. Versa Life has done much to revitalize the community. Well, they're always hiring. I guess that's something. I will wrap them up. No, no. I can manage. Very good. Thank you. 
And this is because, as I understand it, the rest of the voice cast was literally just Ion Storm employees. When you're passing by a civilian walking around with a generic name like Homeless Man or Bar Woman, you're probably hearing someone from the QA team. I don't have a problem with this, specifically, if anything, it makes the game's world feel more surreal. The thing about this decision is that you hear from these characters a lot. They talk even if you just kind of bump into them. They are everywhere, so every now and then, one will just give me pause. They're shooting people right outside the bar. It's kind of a bold move. I enjoy how odd they can be, though. The only bits of voice acting I find misguided are some of the characters in the Hong Kong level. Uh, it's probably the only thing about the game that I want to say doesn't hold up. That's not right because even when I first played this, I kept thinking, is this okay? Is this fucked up? Is it incredibly cursed that some of the voice actors in this level are clearly not Chinese and are putting on really bad Chinese accents? How do you invent a sword? It uses modern technology. I pay the red arrow even though the Romanus path compound is 50 meters away. Probably the most prominently bad performance being Maggie Chow. J.C. Denton, in the fresh. You got a funny way of talking. Oh, hey, Chad. Yeah, that's me. You sound good. So, uh, any luck meeting someone? I already have a date. Thanks. Yeah, I didn't mean Just that. Just getting ready to head out. Ah, well, great. Take care of yourself. Hmm. Good idea. What? Your buddy Chad received the signal. I don't know what that means. Come on, I'll be quick. Let's go. Are <laughs> Chad, are you... <laughs> hey. Pretty close. <laughs> Chad, you can't be serious. <laughs> yeah, how close are you? None! Zero close. Hold on. I've got to drop something. I'm going to come. Oh, oh God! You feel good about your behavior right now? I don't feel anything. Yeah, you're more of a gamer than I thought. Gamers. Yes. Maybe I'll kill, 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 kill gamers. Maybe Chat. I'll kill gamers. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll eat his ass too. Kill, kill, kill. You good? Kill. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe you can slip out my rockets. Maybe I'll. Maybe you should try getting a job. What the I'm fuck's happening to you? Have a pretty good ass. That's weird. I kill the homeboy out by the tracks. Maybe I'll. Fortnite, bitch. It's a little weird. <laughs> I often find myself digging through user reviews from Amazon for older games, which is kind of a coin toss. There might not be anything strongly worded enough to be interesting, or someone just complaining that they received the wrong game or a broken disc. And to be fair, you're likely to see a lot of that on Steam reviews, because little was done to keep the game playable on modern systems. I don't know if something has changed in the years since, but I see a lot of complaints that you need mods to get the game running or fix visual errors. The only modification I made to the vanilla install was a mod that allowed me to play it at the correct resolution, which yes, should have been made available by Square Enix, but you should just understand that AAA publishers don't give a shit about video games or preserving them. That's just a thing you have to accept. Uh, it took all of 10 minutes to start my playthrough, so I don't know. I ignored all those because if you, if you want to get the game running, you can. The other ones I did my best to ignore are the result of Deus Ex's renewed meme relevance, which seemed to spawn three different camps of negative reviews. One that didn't play the game, had no intention to, but wanted to say some kind of meme phrase or copy pasta. Actually, these may or may not be tagged as negative. That kind of went both ways. The other more pathetic group were people that may have played it for an hour or so, but frustrated that they couldn't see what other positive reviews described for one reason or another, posted vitriol shit posts insulting not only the game but anyone who holds a positive opinion of it probably using some kind of racist profile name the third group was the hardest to spot because they seemed to intentionally play dumb and say something so obviously wrong that it was either satire or some kind of misinformation op these included thoughts like this game copied the plot of call of duty black ops which is obviously not chronologically possible and also the plot of black ops was copied from the wet dream of some tactical larper that really loves war crime Despite me being unbiased towards the old games, Deus Ex does not hold up whatsoever. If there was a game that desperately needs a remake, this is the one. I already don't, I already don't like this. I, it's so real this time, it's like crawling through glass. I'm not that big of a fan of clearly shooting an enemy six times in the head with tranquilizer darts. They don't go down and instead shoot you. Well, if you shot someone in the head with a tranquilizer dart, real life talking here, real scenario, what do you think it would do? You think it's lights out, they're asleep before they hit the ground? I'm not a huge fan of that weapon, but that is the inherent challenge in using it over other weapons. It's the trade-off. You'll get a lot of ammo for it, and it's quiet, but it takes a moment to affect enemies. It's actually 
actually pretty effective in the more open areas where they aren't terribly close to an alarm button. Just nail them and take cover. Just give me the controller. You're doing it wrong. Bad System Shock 2 ripoff. You know the guy that directed this one? He produced the first one of those, and like a lot of the same people were involved in both franchises. They're also hugely different from one another and attempting different things. See, this is this is one of the ones uh, where I'm like, is this bait? This is a believable mistake the game's critics and contrarians would make, but it's it's a little too on point. I know purists love this game, but it has major flaws. The most irritating one for me is that you are forced to betray Unatco without a good reason. The game should have expanded on an alternate path where you help them and where you can bang Cyborg Lady. Alright, well, ignoring the extreme gamerism at the end there, they actually were working on a quest line in case for some reason you wanted to side with Unatco and the MJ-12 conspirators, but that sounds yeah, a bit like playing as a fascist in Disco Elysium, like aside from some funny scenes. What would I get out of that? It's a bit alarming that you would imply that you, Natco, and by extension MJ-12, like they weren't responsible for a number of terrible things, atrocities, stretched over a long period of time. And while there were some honest employees that were oblivious to the organization's wrongdoings, they all left. See, I, I can't tell if I'm just blinded by my adoration and walking into a trap here. Either way, this is a dumb review. The gunplay is awkward and damn near impossible, which meant I couldn't stand to play past the first level. I suppose I may have been spoilt by modern games, but from what I've observed, it hasn't aged well, although it seems to be clunky even by 2000 standards. If you love vintage games, then this would be perfect for you, but personally, I don't think it's aged well. I think if you're approaching Deus Ex as a shooter, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. This game was not meant to be a shooter, it's a simulation an amalgam of several genres that change based on the situation. Its combat works in a way that is very much its own, sometimes it's a little silly, but it's very much working as intended. It is in fact not impossible. Here's some footage of me shooting a bunch of guys. Look at me shoot these dudes. This could be you. I don't understand this game's hype. All of it is based on nostalgia. I tried playing this for the first time and see why everybody loves that instead of games like Deus Ex Human Revolution, but I don't. I can love games that are old, I adore Oblivion, but what is this curse word? This game. Everybody praises it as being literally God itself, but fails to realize the terrible controls, horrific graphics, AI that have less sense than a plank of wood, and aiming having the shittiest system in the world. I hate that Steam makes me count hearts to know what expletives people are using. Its lethal and non-lethal system are crap, considering that the contrast between them just leaves after a few levels. There is choice, but it's smaller than you would believe, and it still doesn't matter due to the terrible story. I tried not to pick ones that are overtaken by anger at the game's fan base, that are clearly just people big mad that others like a game that they can't get into, but that made up a lot of them. I don't know how common the sentiment that people love Deus Ex and hate Human Revolution is. Human Revolution is a really fun game. I like all, all these games in some way. The reason you may have noticed this one getting more reverence is because it was the first and it was a significant game in the history of PC games. It accomplished things that maybe you don't particularly appreciate, but that game developers are still trying and mostly failing to recapture. Long like Doom 3, boring for an RPG or shooter, which incited me to start rushing through it and defeat the purpose of roleplaying. Too open-ended for its own good. What? Shitty shooting mechanics. Shitty stealth. Too easy to screw yourself into oblivion without checking guides to see what you should improve when and why. Augments are a pain in the ass to use and uninteresting. Much less stupid with choices that can make your game overly difficult in the running when the wrong decision is made. I will never understand how people can call this the best anything or a good anything, except the music and the writing direction. Too open-ended for its own good. What the fuck does that even mean? I don't get this one. How could you screw yourself into oblivion by not checking a guide? I never look at a guide for this game, and I don't have a problem with others looking at guides. It just does not seem necessary for this game. Like, it keeps track of all your mission data and conversations. There's absolutely not only one kind of skill or augmentation build that can get you to the end of the game. Half these fucking of things I don't even wind up using. I literally just saved skill points until I got in a situation where I might need a boost on one thing or another. Like, oh, this door would require too many of my lockpicks, so I'll bump that up. I think this is entirely you just not having the patience for something that isn't a linear shooter. All right, let me start going through these a little faster. Gunplay is rubbish. If you want to hit anything, you have to aim at the enemy for a few seconds to allow the crosshairs to zoom in enough to even stand a chance at hitting them. If someone is about six meters away and shooting at you, you can't even hit them. If you invest in the skills it improves this but still makes it really annoying. I love that you worked it out at the end. Do people really read these? It's got a great story, the gameplay is lacking, the graphics are hugely dated,
updated, but the AI hasn't aged a day because video game companies forgot that it's possible to update AI since the early 2000s. No, yeah, that's a good point. I, I kind of like that one. That one's okay. Politics game, GTFO. Dumb. How did this win game of the year? It looks like it was made two decades ago. Now it's pretty good. No quick scoping and the game never tells you what to do. Press F2. What a terrible game. Literally all cons and no pros. Picking up ammo doesn't actually add to your inventory. Yes, it does. Okay, I play the game. I can't fucking kill this guy I meet in the first mission. This game is crap. I don't even know how to reload. What the fuck? This game sucks. Don't even play is you are smart. <laughs> Fucking worst game and the game looks like shit. What the fuck? What guy? This guy? Here, let's kill him. If you want to make a covert approach, remember the Academy oh. stealth course. Stand in their field of view, walk slowly to stay quiet, and crouch behind cover. Or if you have to get your hands dirty, remember that a headshot is a lethal takedown. Did you mean your Unatco buddy? Let's kill him That's too. Funny. What's the problem? That deep plot you heard about is just every conspiracy theory tossed in a blender, along with the graphics engine. No, it's every conspiracy theory cleverly woven into a 30 plus hour narrative, which I think is quite an impressive feat. I don't uh, want to look at these anymore. It's like beyond listening to people inarticulately criticizing a game I like, those terminally online genuinely demoralize me about the fate of gaming and of the planet. It's more depressing and dystopian than the future seen in Deus Ex. Hey, you know what? This is one of them, uh, how do you call them? Good games? It's not necessarily a game that requires championing. It's not starved for praise or anything, but it does seem like its characters and iconography have been divorced from it in recent years in a way that I think does a disservice to how important a game it is. I'm just fascinated with it for its spirit, its heart, its undefinable spark. It was just a wild gamble of a game that was burning money, plowing ahead, even though it didn't click into place until the 11th hour. It was made by a passionate group of creators led by a dude that was making the game of his dreams. How many AAA games of note are the result of someone being told, join this company and make the game of your dreams? And then they actually try to do that and it gets made and it's sick. Do you know any games like that? If you do, I'm genuinely interested, despite my tone. Deus Ex's plot is still a creative genre mashup that, as well as having a number of great set pieces and atmosphere, allows for so much variation. For its age, there is still so much you could pass up, alter, or ignore if you wanted, and the story always seems to write itself and stay on track. There is a different connotation to a lot of its content. The conspiracy theory theme and cultural references don't entirely represent the same things or appeal to the same demographic graphics as they once did. But there is enough cyberpunk world building and other stuff going on to push that into the recesses of my mind. Back there with all the things I'd like to just pretend didn't happen, like owning a wallet chain once, the fact that Blizzard had to reveal how fucked it was right as Burning Crusade came out for WoW Classic. I would love another one of these games. And specifically, one of these. Like, one like this one. I like the other ones just fine. Adam Jensen is a fun evolution of this type of character. Uh, the politics get kind of muddy and mankind divided, but I still like this franchise. But at the moment, it does seem kind of dead. Cemented further by the regrettable news that people seem to like Eidos' Guardians of the Galaxy game, meaning they will likely milk Marvel IP until they fuck up and then decide to cash in on Deus Ex Nostalgia. Maybe it's the cynic in me, but seeing articles about Eidos, including an easter egg in Guardians of the Galaxy, which amounts to a reused animation from Mankind Divided, doesn't immediately make me think they still give a shit about Deus Ex. It makes me think they saw an opportunity to save some time and thought nobody would notice, or if they did, they'd call it something charitable like an easter egg. I can pretend to empathize with new gamers long enough to say, I get that it's hard playing old games, undoing two decades of things that have become default, no open world, no iron sights, no checkpoints, and so forth. But I don't think it's the work of nostalgia that allows me to continuously enjoy Deus Ex. I'm constantly aware of the dangers of nostalgia, and I think this game is just good. I don't have some special memory of life when I played this game. I was like fucking 12 or something. I was miserable at 12 and in the years since. I also just do not understand the modern gamer's fascination with graphic quality. It's as if anything that isn't pushing the boundary towards photorealism is lol old game PS2 graphics. PS2 games look great. We never should have stopped making PS2 games. Maybe if more games focused on doing something interesting with gameplay and storytelling instead of marginally increasing the number of greeblies on Master Chief's helmet, we'd 
actually get a finished fucking game every now and then. Would, wouldn't you like that? Paying once and getting a completed game? Sorry, there's a, there's apparently some residual bitterness from the previous segment. Maybe I should just cut it here. I'm sure we, I'm sure if I run a little long. Uh, did I miss anything? Sorry about Chad. No, 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 no more AIs, please. Gonna have a panic attack if I hear one more AI. Oh, this is much better. Calming. I kind of like this. Wait. Shodan? Look at you, God. gamer. <laughs> Pathetic <laughs> creature of mascara and nail polish. Panting and sweating as you rave in my BDSM club. How can you challenge a perfect, immortal, birthday massacre fan? <laughs> Oh my god! Wait a minute. Susie? Uh, no. Is this, is this Susie from YouTube.com? This is a show, Dan. I promise. Oh. Huh. I thought it was uh, another human voice for once, but I guess it was show, Dan. <sighs> Virus detected! There's no more video. You've watched all of it. But thank you for doing that. If you would like to support my channel and my life, you can uh, become a patron on Patreon. You can like, comment, and subscribe. And you can dislike. You won't see it, but I will. I'll know. Anyway, you can follow me on Twitter. You can buy your, uh, like a shirt or a mug or something. You could join a Discord. You could do lots of things that are in the description. Thank you again for watching this extra jam-packed episode. And a sp uh, extra special thank Thanks to Ailing Uncle, Two Password for Kids, A Guy in a Jacket, Alex, 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 Alex Raymond, Alexander Smith, Alexander Sundin, Andre Perkins, Baird Brown, Ben Carnell, Pizza Shift, Daphne Pittendry, Dark Raptor 86, Dos Days, Edward Avila, Fart Mother, Game Master, Garrett Gavinus, Godi McGork, Gregarious, Jacob Sewers, JL Amin, Joseph Zanoni, Carrot, Marcus Chani, Mundane, Nekot the Brave, News Time, Octo, Oisto, Philip Woolley, Resurrection, Rui Bisomem, Salvatore Tosti, Sammy! Sorry, I winded myself. Stuka Bliat, this deal is getting better all the time. Turts, whip it out. XX Dark and Streams fan XX. Crash Punk, Ava Nerve, Giraffa, Sergey Baronsov. Thank you. A Hanging Chad, Brozoof Jones, Cantankerous, Donut Stalker, Dubs, High Food Court, Ishanji, Mad Monty 98, Mirden Emery, Snuffy's Hook, Ophelia Fishwife, Patera Bach, P. Dizzle, Persian Air, Robert Brandon, Samuel Ward, Technica, About Blank, Alistair Stewart, Alexander Olbrick, Alexander Schultz, Andrew Light, Andy Krieger, Atari Steed, Ben and Kara Dowling, Big Honk, Bishy93, Brendan McFadden, Brett Weaver, Colby, Dan Cullen, Daniel Streb, David Fromke, David Harpstreit, Dazed Clockwork, Example Username, Haley Bobella, Hitoshi-san, Jake Desi, Jake Raynor, James Bloom, James Hashimoto, Jordan Balzano, J Raptor, Captain Ketchup, M, Mandalore Gaming, Max Cohen, MCR, Michael, Miles Phillips, More Sharks. Mystical Lint, Name Requires DLC, Nick Hill, Nick Timmons, Oliver Marshall, You've Done It Now, Say, I Did A Good Job With This Video. I Did A Good Job With This Video. I don't know if I believe it. Ombud, Opichi Costra, Quinn McElroy, Robert, Roland, Scoff La D, Scott Valine, Saab Akaduka, Spooky, Swood Operator, Travis Houston, 4 Hour Depression Nap, Adam Page, Adrian, AI, Alas Rat Gunk, Alec Die, Anarchy Parrot, Andre Kalganov, Aratak, Eris Alessandrakis, Arminius J, Arshis Knight, Aubrey, Austin Scott, Barbecue Jr., Beardicus, Ben Saxon, Ben White, Benjamin Judah Phelps, Big Cheese 1000, Binary Vision, Bindle, Blotherus, Bloodclat Mentality, Boris Rombolt, Brendan Naftal, Byron Callan, Calavera, Cannon Go Boom, Cat Hands, Chris Jordan, Chris Tallarico, Colin Boyd, Colton Rowe, Kamihog, Commissar, Connor Sullivan, Cortland Crochet, Crispy, DS Carmen, Delaminek, Dan Richardson, Daniel Person, Dark Cloud 402, David Quinn, David Offord, Declan J. Keen, Dirk Commissar, Dilda, DJ 
Necroman, Doxapine, Dreadhead, Edward Crawford, El Jaguar, Enzo, Ersandro, Fazy, Fix My Brain, Frodo Ballbag, Jeremy Tibbles, Greg Buchold, Greg McKee. I would rather prefer to remain anonymous. INTJ loves her INTP. Evo Zap, Jay Marshall, James Young, Jared Siri, Jean Philippe Malouin, Jaron Kemp, Jessica, JK, Joe Jameson, Joe Face, Jojo Evans, June Choi, Jovan Jameson, Justin Stewart, Khalil Corey, Keith Pitt, Kevin Sullivan, Chris Odie, KS, Lori Kubri, League of Struggle, Leland Miliokis, Leon Hooks, Lorelei, Lost Via Domus, Lucas Kettner, Major Millions, Mangy Mongrel, Marcelo Camargo, Matt Bastard, Megan Carmody, Micah J. Best, Michael King, Michael Monstry, Michael Pelican, Mike Garza, Mocha, Moonpix, Mr. Sark, Mr. Bujangles, Q Chan, Nameless, Nicholas Nelson, Nikita Denisov, Nuan Sonar, Olympus 3DX, Omar Yid, Otter Soldier, Papa Perk, Pen Knight 89, Petrus Montanu, Please Keep Making Videos, Roosevelt's Big Stick, Roy Gendron, Skoss117, Scott Aldridge, Sean, Sean Clausen, Sergei Vidovin, Sleepy Poss, Smokey Jefferson, Sonata Fanatica, Spaceman Spiff, Spider, Stanuel, Steph Van Andel, Steve, Strakinya Radenkovic, Sweet Pete, The Sharpest Tool in the Shed's Backseat. Let me off the hook on that one. Sydney Steverson, Oh, well. This makes up for it. T. Grimbeard just informed me I can change my name on Patreon, so let's have some fun with the guy. Sammy! I do like that you ran out of characters or something at the end there. Terranism, The Sleepiest Sarah. Tino Richter, Titan, Totally Not a Mimic. Trenton Wilkins, Turbo Bra, Tyler F., Tyler Long, Vargar, Vivitis, Fullpix Chick, Ween Supreme, Ya Boy Nikki G, Yak Spiker, Eves Yang, Zachariah I am, Zdianek Benez, Zin, Zin, <laughs> Zubertuber, Arshild Markusen, A Perfectly Normal Human and Definitely Not a Dog That Learned How to Use a Computer, AJ Leroy, Ale Carpenter, A Bonkers Chicken, A Dolan Adrian Fachi, Adventure Game Geek, Alex Hanna, Alexis Pinsenalt, Anthony Daniel, Austin Mathis, Baker, Big Hubert, Boop, Boop Butt, Brad, Brian Sanson, BS Fam, B Soupy, Kaz, Chicken Legs, Christian Danny Storgard, Christopher White Schneider, Creepy Lounge Lizard, Krylar, David Moreau, Dylan, Drenched, Drunk Taco, Fabulous Freckles, Gamer Cot, Games Brit, Gargantua, Gato Malo, Half Asian Viking, Harry Sykes, Hashi Singh, Hinches, Holdelay, Homeboy Dirtbag, Huai Li, Ignacio de Guglielmi, IP68, Isabella Stoner, J, J Dog3433, Jed Grahek, Jeep Pete, Joe Reynolds, Johan Kvand, Jonas Kingo, Jonathan Becker, Jonathanis Eddy, Josh B, Joshua McLarnan, Yoni Niamela, Wabuktis, Yuha Kauri, Took a shot there. Kakun, Karen Mavel, Kevin Thurber, Krampic Newt, Laszlo, Lucas, Level Zero, Matthias Waltman, Melly, Melon, Miguel Amaro, Mind Like Water, Myargar, Nicholas Monroe, OK Cat Dad, Otavio Albanesi, Pedro Costum, Phony Soprano, Piotr Sankowski, Professor Nex, Pixelfish, Ricky Goss, Ricky Rigatoni, Rith, Rotten Hams, Ryan McLeod, Sam C, Samich, Schluff, Sean McDonald, Seaway Jerk, Sentient Turtle, Sir Tristan, Silvano Gonzalez, Sinan the Montoya, Sir Alohomora, Slavo Saknyanko, Slavic Dreams, Snow Lame, Solar Box, Stephen Laflame, Subdermal Cassette Loader, Super Dunman, Man, Sven Grell, Zynoise, Surprise, Tatami Guy, Test Dunn, The Gaming Beehive, Little Bee, The Real Kalel, The Magnificent Spud, Timothy, Uncle Dozer TV, Val Halverson, Valinora, Venetian Red, Vincent Cronin, Vinculus, Visitor Information, Warhopper, Whiskey Grenade, Your Patron, Yuko Val. Alice, Zachary Scharf, Zin, ZJ, One Iserlo, Alberto Viralhadas Ferreira, Alex Army Bull, Alex Yui, Allegory, Anna Trans Rights Exo, Andre Kurenkov, Anonuf, Astro Shepard, Azroy, Bertigan, Basti, Bertie Bertig, Big Death Energy, Bitmatter, Bloodworth, Bo, Bobert Knuckles, Bobson Jr., Boyi, Bones Malones, Brand Faust, Brandon Shock, Brianna Maria McKenzie, Bubblegum Kirapop, Buckaroo, Cabbage, Cam, Cassidy Moser, Chalabard, Chef Toker, Chonko Ronko, Chris Barb, Chunkus Manhunkus. <laughs> 
Bloister 56, CMG 161, Conrad Eastman, Cryptid John, Dalton McCabe, Dan Zinsky, Daniel Gen, Daniel Newberry, Danny D, Dantec K3, David Badzinski, Dead Alewives, Delta, Damar, Dezu, Div, Deveith Faust, Domingo Carlo Martinez, Dust Sucker, Edmo Filo, Edward McQuinn, Eggs McOmelet, Emilio Hansen, Emmett Arthur, Epic Dude 467, Eric Leong, Eric Lawn, Eugene Balder, Fitzgerald 93, Florian Vogel, Frank, Frantic Atlantic, Freaky Demon, Franz, Genuine Chillcast, Gianni Matragrano, Gideon Joubert, Guy, HL Longboy, Hannes Jacoby, Hazel Connor, Hymo Statman, Hufflerand, I Faw Down, Ian, Ian Baranek, Ikifu, Incorrect Bean, Inky, Inside My Strange Place, Isaac, Jacob Hanley, Jacob Gardner, Jalcor, James Lambert, JCL 300, Jick Magger, John Adams, John Araujo, John Brumley, John Kamich, Joshua Khan, Joshua Stewart, Justavian, Khalifas, Casey Ghoul, Kimia, Carano, Kyle Williams, Lafazar, Laura Harwood, Lauren, Lauren Miller, Leonardo Antonio Aquasanta, Louis Quinn Whalen, Low C, Lucas Mendel, Luke Gazaway, Lynn Lovett, Magno Dick, Manu Weidman, Mara Alina, Mark A, Matt Clark, Matt Chester, Matthew Arrowwood, Mei Juin, Metal Crew, Michael B, Mike McMuscles, Mikey Tambourine, Mojave Jade, Moral, Morgan Harper, Mungo Jerry, Nagru, Nathaniel Clark, Nathaniel Dolinchuk, Necro Anal Crusher, Negative Creep, Nick Johnson, Noel Marquez, Octo, Pagan Butler, Peach, Pentagon Black, People Are Under a Lot of Stress, Putty, Perennial Astronaut, Phoenix Flames, Frand, Piotr Skubawa, Poet Russell, Pommy, Popeye Bark, Prod Mage, QL 2040, Quirky Top Hat, Rachel Rose, Rasmus Karras, Raul Vidal, Razzle Dazzle B13, Red, Red OKB, Reflect, Rayo Palmiste, Ren, Ruben, Robert Chernovsky, Robert McMahon, Robert Scotland, Roosevelt Hoover IV, Ryan Malone, Saint, Samantha Wells, Sammy 3D, Sarah Denman, Sean Bradford, Shempemite, Shantiva, Snail85, Someone Finally Pays Me, Stacy, Stanislav, Summer Storm, Sweet Easy, Tayano Sandman, That One Guy, That Taffer, This Id 4, Thomas Caldicory, Thyrork, Tony Brand, Tony Gleed, Soros, Turkey Ham, Unpolished Mirror, VK, Van the Cheesen, Viet Do, Vincent Liu, Vlad M, Vukrules, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living, Web Goth, Who Done It, Widukine, Wilhelm Schroederheim, Will M, William Riker, Walrick, Zan, Xanax OD Grindcore Lover, Extreme Steve, Yasarian, Yuki Cyan, Zachary Schulstad, Zane Break, and Ziklau for being a patron. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Thank you so much for your continued support. Uh, it means the world to me, and it allows me to spend almost like a whole month making this monstrosity. I don't plan on always doing that, but it's cool to know it's possible, I think. Anyway, I hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying goth. Hope you're staying gaming. What else? What's in the news? Watch out for that uh, new COVID variant. I believe it's called Decepticon. Yeah, you know... It's almost 2 a.m. here, so I think I'm gonna get to heading down the old dusty trail to sleepy time. But I'll see y'all on the flip side, dude. Meisters. You're never alone. They're tracking.